Cam, Tom, and JJ coming to you. To discuss it with Bigfoot. Yeah. <laughs> coming to the Canadian comedy <laughs> troupe that is. <laughs> you got, yeah, no, you're on the right track. Yeah, you got to have some uh, serious guitar things before we get Mon- to the Monday night, the Monday night football theme. <laughs> before they replaced it with that jerk, <laughs> Hank Williams yeah. Jr., you know. <laughs> uh, Mike Post wasn't available, so yeah. No. <laughs> oh, so we're talking about the self described tight knit. Canadian comedy troupe, uh, the kids in the hall. We are just describing their just various skits, uh, just as well as the works of the various members: Dave Foley, Bruce McCullough, the self-described handsome one, Kevin McDonald, Mark McKinney, who, fun fact, just had his birthday four days ago, and Scott Thompson. Well, his birthday a couple days before that. Oh. <laughs> That's why they get along. They all have each other's birthdays not far apart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, they, they've all worked on just so many different things. You've seen their work on news radio, Conan O'Brien, and uh, just, I mean, they were working with, they were produced by Lauren Michaels on an off season from SNL. So yeah, they, they were broadcast on Canadian Broadcasting Channel and NBC, respectively, and recently no, it returned was, for Amazon Prime. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it was uh, CBC and CBS. CBS took over the last two seasons. Oh, that's yeah, right. because they were on after Letterman. Ah, um, there you go. That's the drawing. <laughs> yeah, Keep that audience. Um, so. It, don't you find it interesting how they have just continually just like come up in crowds like they they've always survived even though they weren't always syndicated just now ifc's been syndicating them a bunch uh, uh brain candy didn't make any money at the time they even make fun of that in the return series is like yeah. it made 12 dollars, <laughs> but now it made a million <laughs> now you guys are back and now we've broken even now it's broken even. <laughs> we can bring you back. Um, so I mean, we're 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 all tackling just various comedy uh, tropes and uh, groups here. Uh, you know, Monty Python. We just covered Marx Brothers last Thursday, and you know, we're always talking Mystery Science Theater. It, how do you think they've survived as long as they have? Especially when they they're like big and like. Iceland or something or like one part of Brazil they're not all that big and surprisingly in like Mexico or Britain or any other thing I, that would be a go-to typically I think they were big in the United States because of the fact that number one during the time that they were on uh, HBO which they were heavily hyped um, they were you know they HBO was looking for something to put on late at night and Lauren Michaels was like okay look I'll give you this these guys I found in Canada and the funny thing is McKinney and Mark McKinney and Bruce McCullough were on SNL like a cup they were like writers or something before that like yeah. they were they were they were in kids in the hall he Lauren Michaels brought them to New York they were kind of like disillusioned and they went back to Canada and you know then they started kids in the hall um, you know, they started up the show. Um, I think it was, I think the reason why the show has such a lasting power is because it was the show that all the kids who didn't like SNL. Yeah, watched. fair enough. It was kind of like, yeah, if you weren't watching that or Mad TV or, or even in Living Color, it's like you're going to yeah. these guys for a sketch excuse. Yeah. And like Monty Python. The whole zaniness of it all is like what, yeah, just unpredictability, yeah. not nothing connecting one any of the dots together, and yet no. at the same time, you just want to go into this I mean, abyss. <laughs> just, I mean, all I can remember is like, I'm like, they're from Canada, they're funny, the monologues they did were hilarious, 
so much thought put into it. It's like, who could yeah. come up with that? No one. You know, um, like, uh, the writing dynamics were, were even with each other. There was no weak, like, writing. Like, the thing with Python is, is that, you know, you could tell when it's, um, um, you know, Graham Chapman or John Cleese sketch was on or, um, who wrote what? You know, uh, yeah, Terry Gilliam coming up with, with the animation. With this, it was, <laughs> it was the five of them and uh, the sixth the sixth guy, Paul Bellini, um, who, wor- who worked with Scott Thompson a lot because they were both, they were uh, friends. And Bellini's, Paul Bellini was the guy who used to walk around with the towel wrapped around his waist all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, in fact, they had a thing called the Touch Bellini Contest. Um, or spot spot Paul Bellini, and then there was one called Touch Paul Bellini. They had two contests, right? So uh, it, it was the writing dynamic. I mean, you knew who Scott Thompson's sketches were because they were generally geared towards um, gay because Scott Thompson's gay. But yeah, the the, the the monologues he had as Buddy Buddy Cole, the, the gay bartender, were f- fucking hilarious. <laughs> you know, and. Uh, and some sketches, like, you couldn't air them now unless it's afterwards, because even though no. they don't really show anything, they are a little just dark. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember the first time they were on HBO, you know, they, they did well. And uh, I, they were brought on comic relief. Oh, nice. Okay, now, you got to set the stage. Billy Crystal is introducing them and there's this group of they do this sketch about a bunch of childhood friends sitting around a fire talking, and how they ritually ritually murdered their friend uh, Mitch. <laughs> yeah, they're going into everything. <laughs> the recent show has even gone even more graphic with uh, baby miscarrying and uh, uh, adultery. But yeah, it was what, like, show, what show? The the more recent Kids in the Hall that's on. Yeah, Amazon yeah, Prime yeah. They, now. They've done they've done some, yeah. But, but um, this is what they've all talked about. It's like let's let's be an unofficial kind of just dark comedy. Just like yeah, it was just such a dark. Sc- I mean, here they are. You know, it's like, and they come on stage and they do this. They do this bit, and people are laughing, but it's not an overwhelming laugh. Yeah, there should I be laughing? See, <laughs> because it was it was to me it was like it's like the first time Python appeared on US TV because I remember Joey Bishop was hosting on the Tonight Show. And supposedly yeah. he said, I, I, I'm told that they're funny. <laughs> and it's like, here's Billy Crystal, you know, successful comedian, you know, and you got Rob Williams, you got Whoopi Goldberg, and these five Canadian guys come on and just basically just do like this. It's like watching a punk rock band at the opera. Yes. That's that the, is the best. <laughs> That's a great metaphor. It, and, uh, you know, Electric Light Orchestra, for God's sakes, was basically yeah. the pioneer of that. But yeah, uh, I, I hell, my first concert was seeing Yes, and it was at an opera house. So it's second nature now, but growing up, yeah, everyone was like, it would oh, be like no, the, you it, don't it would be like It would be like the, the Ramones playing at the New York Opera. Because here's all these, <laughs> because here were all these people, they were there to see like these like old, you know, you know the, the stand-up comics and this Canadian sketch group comes in and does this humor that is dark this one sketch that's dark and it's like you, you start to laugh a little you know, like I'm, I was laughing my parents didn't find it funny when they saw it but I was laughing you know because they're <laughs> like but the thing was was that HBO ran, did comic relief and they were having their show put on and I think the thing was it spoke to a lot of kids that you know again didn't like Saturday Night Live couldn't stand Adam Sandler, you know, like it was that whole beginning of the Adam Sandler, you know. They'd already had uh, a bad '80s season, so the '90s guys, you know, they, well, yeah. well, a lot of them were the icons in their own respect. To right, there were still some that were just kind of just bruising the the whole mentality of it. Or it's like, yeah, we we need something even more different now. We we gotta yeah, figure and, out. Yeah. And you had the kids that got it, and and the kids that didn't get it. And the kids that got it were like kids like me who basically were like, you know, I get the jokes here. Right. I get the it's jokes. an underground, yep. much like an yeah. underground music scene. It's like, uh, not only do the right people get it, but it's the best kind of joke that 
you, you yeah. it's so much awesome when it's like, oh my God, I thought I was the only one who saw that. I'm so glad you've seen it. I remember like going in to work, like I was working on a weekend and they were on like on a Friday, they were on HBO on a Friday. And I said, I saw this show called The Kids in the Hall and the one friend, my guy work was like, oh yeah, those those guys, yeah, they're all gay. And I'm like, no, one of them's gay. And he's like, well, <laughs> you know. They did do drag really, really well, they, though, by the way. They did drag better than Python, I think. Yeah, by Python, they didn't even bother covering up their Adam's apples or sounding no. feminine. They would just be like... I mean, Christ, David, David Foley was the most convincing female of the bunch. Yes. You know. yeah. Oh, God. He would always inject yeah. that into some of his comedy movies, which are very underrated and that no one saw, yeah. unfortunately, where he would always have to, is like, I guess I better dress up as someone I'm on the run from the cops or I'm spying on my ex-lover. <laughs> well, the one I love is uh, they did it. On, he was on Conan one night and he said like he had his, he had a black wig on. And someone <laughs> said, someone said he had like a black short haired wig on. Someone said, Oh, I love all your movies. And he's like, what? He's like, yeah, I look like Elizabeth. Someone said, I look like, uh, what's her name? Ro- uh, Rossellini. Isabella Rossellini. Isabella Rossellini. Yeah. And then Mark McKinney does a, movie with isabella rossellini called the saddest music in the world <laughs> which is yeah. a great movie to watch. yeah great movie to watch um but yeah he put the wing on he's like i don't and listen, he looks in the camera and like and they're like you're like holy shit he looks like Is- 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 isabella rossellini but um the thing with the humor was it was like they would have these little vignettes of like um monologues which not a lot of uh, comedy shows did, you know? Like, Python never really had a monologue thing. No. It was all um, just jump right into it and with, a cold, yeah. like you say, a cold open, and then, what the hell did I just watch? I got to keep watching. This is yeah. insane. <laughs> and, you know, they do these little things, like they did, like, Bruce McCullough would do these things called 30-second stories. Um, which is like, you know, <laughs> it would be like a children's thing. Um, they yep. do it's a fact. This little girl would run up and go, It's a fact. The queen doesn't know her ABCs. And it was it was uh Scott Thompson dressed as Queen Elizabeth going like A B C D Q R T V M J L L Hello. <laughs> yeah. And uh they do uh like Bruce McCall called this thing called the Daves I know. These <laughs> the are the Daves, Daves I know and oh, these are the Daves I know, you know. If you watch it, it's like, it's like okay, you're jumping in. You you you've got the you got the you've got the first song, you know the first album. Now you're gonna now you, you you've heard side one, now side two's coming up, and that's the second half of season one. And I gotta say, it was like it was getting better as time goes along, you know. Yeah, it wasn't it, like Python. Yeah, Python. You pretty much knew what you're in for it was instantly quotable it instantly weird and you're just like i i love it and th- this just gets even better just the more and more people repeat it and the ones who don't get it you're eventually gonna get it. it's just it so definitely watch it with a room full of people you know, who have or haven't seen it and it'll it'll spread like a virus too soon i know and they, but had, just and they well the thing was python kind of had to take off you know slowly you yeah, know, local as, PBS as affiliates up. were playing it. Well, every, even they, in England, they considered them a joke at the time, and it yeah. just caught on afterwards. And uh, you you can't tell me that no one in this day and age hasn't already, you know, tried to ma- squish someone with their fingers. <laughs> well, <laughs> the thing I love was all the characters they had. Yeah, like they had all... like Mark Mark McKinney's chicken lady was one of the like the funniest thing. Like was funny. You know, totally. just, it was I just lo- so odd to see a man dressed like a lady who's like a chicken and she's got this high like, hey, how are you? Like that, you know. You're right. This is that. And then uh how you you've, doing? Got, you've got uh Mark Mc- I think it was Mark McKinney and Scott Thompson as these like two teenage guys that are like obsessed with like movie stars and they talk <laughs> like this, you know. Um, and their dream yeah. sequences anytime they're doing something like that man yeah that's where the budget's going <laughs> and then you have the kathy's who work at at and love 
you know, <laughs> how are you doing, Kevin? Oh, oh, you wouldn't, you know, like that was great because it was, it was like, but the, the humor in it was just so, it was surreal and it didn't get tiring. You know. Never tiring. You wanted more of it after each skit. Uh, I feel like Tim and Eric owe a lot to this. Uh, I loved seeing yeah. Eddie Izzard on the recent season because I was like, he was a lot of the same kind of predicament. Even though he's British, is like same kind of uh, comedy and drag and just other stuff that is like, man, not only has no one done that before, but like, and only you could come up with this, but it, like, it. Your just your pacing and your timing just so yeah. articulate. No, yeah. no one is feeling like okay, that needs to be five minute sketch, or that would work on SNL, or that would work in a movie. Is like it works anywhere you got it. Like endless energy, and like you say, just you can tell they've rehearsed this. They've only been doing this all their lives, jumping off of sofas, doing community theater, and just yeah. developing a persona. Tom, Tom, you okay? I'm fine. It's my dog that's that's being a little oh, bit loud. Right, okay. But um, um, I will. I will, sure. I do want to uh, say uh, something here. It's going back to the original question about why these guys have have lasted for as long as did. I have I have two different thoughts on it. One of them is that they're immensely talent. Talent never gets boring. No. And the other side of it is I think they're all just extremely likable. Yeah. And they're chameleons. They're not, yeah. That's why they've They're done good. People, right? That they, they, yeah. No, no one's gonna ever see them kicking someone's dog or <laughs> running someone over like Ferris Bueller did. But it is interesting how uh, they, uh, their chameleons, both as comedians and just as talents. Like so, yeah. When they weren't doing Kids in the Hall, they were doing all sorts of other stuff, giving outrageous stuff for other comedians to say, and then, yeah, going back and doing this. And then on again, off again, doing some stand-up concerts. Uh, I mean, the closest iteration I can think is uh, nowadays might be the Trailer Park Boys. Those guys started off doing yeah. a mockumentary, ma- making it look like, like home video shot on Canada. And that was part of the appeal. And then when they came back on Netflix, they started taking advantage of the live shows. And that was funny too, because again, like Python, you know, everyone knows all the various skits and they, they anticipate it. They, they've they re-seen the tapes as much as they've had. They're, yeah, they're and that's funny just... censored versus R-rated. They're funny with any venue because there's something for everyone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, yeah. Sorry, go, ahead, go ahead, Tom. Yeah. No, go ahead, Tom. The idea I had was I kind of see them as a combination of, or at least a halfway between the, the Broken Lizard guys who did Super Troopers. Ooh. Good contrast. And a bit of Fry and Lori. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Fry and because Lori. If memory yeah. serves, a bit of Fry and Lori did does do some monologue every once in a while. Yeah, they did. But here and there, I'm sure they were watching each other's material eventually and saying, hey, I, uh, but I don't want to, I'm not going to steal a joke per se. I'm going to literally just do a similar style and do my take on it and or maybe even as a nod, you know, as a tribute, because that's well, similar backgrounds, definitely. Well, the thing I've always said about them is that they would have, the thing I've said about Python is that, you know, it's sad though, because, you know, now there's only four left of them, but yeah, um, when they did that reunion show. I, I went there to the live broadcast. It was amazing. Yeah. That, that was my father's birthday gift. I was like, that, that, <laughs> that it, it, this is the best birthday gift we're ever going to get. <laughs> but the thing was, was that when I watch it, it's like a band coming out, doing their greatest hits. Not, and then they never the sold out. And we never yeah. got enough of them. And by the way, they're not kidding. This is the final act. <laughs> yeah hanging up kids in the hall you got to realize they had time off they had almost you know over 27 years off they came back with the sixth season and it was like you know now they could do more they didn't have the cbc jumping down their throats you know right you that, can't ho- hear that. That, whole, <laughs> that whole david foley as the radio host guy after an apocalyptic war was i mean it was, it was so dark and I was, I was, I was laughing the whole time. I'm like, 
I'm like, I don't know if I should be laughing at this. And also I'm like, wait, the only thing he plays is Melanie's rollers. You know, I've got a brand new king. Brand new pair of rollers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he's like, that look on his face, like when the record stops, he's like, no, oh, not a lot of traffic today. Here we go. Another, uh, yeah. I got a brand new pair of rollers. You got a brand new key. And I'm like, I just like, and that look on his face when the record stops, it's like, you know, I got to face reality, but I'll turn the record back on me. I mean, that's what made that sketch so funny. Right. Um, all these, just like they're all different characters who all get along, that they, they create all these scenarios that don't at all go together. And yet, uh, that is the gist of it. It's like, they coexist. It, it, it's a hellish reality they created upon you to unleash. And uh, you, you just can't stare away. It, it's just like seeing something horrible. And it, it just... Uh, it's so shocking you, your eyes cannot bounce anywhere else <laughs> exactly well, well the one sketch i love is david foley talking about how bad of a doctor he is <laughs> yes <laughs> he's like, like, he's oh like, he's like you know something <laughs> i'm a terrible doctor he's got like blood all over himself you know he's laughing and he knows it and he's like oh what <laughs> yeah. like like if i was taking a test in high school and i wasn't doing that the other students would help me they go like mitochondria you know <laughs> <laughs> and like kevin mcdonald's stuff was just so it, if you read about kevin mcdonald's life his father was a really bad alcoholic so oh, he does God. this sketch called daddy drank where <laughs> david foley plays his father and he says like you know son i just want you to like but at one point like he gives him he gives him tap shoes right <laughs> what the hell are you gonna make tap shoes you little bastard i didn't want these for christmas you know and then, and then he, he's like one night something happened all of a sudden his father walks in he's got like his hands ready to choke him he's like oh i was uh i just wanted to see how you were doing son um, and he had the tap shoes on he's like he's like i'm gonna put some carpeting on this floor later so you know if you don't hear me <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it, it's it's kind of like it's kind of like like every episode you didn't know what was going to come out yeah and, there, and there's some parts in there when you watch it you know if you're not a canadian you don't know what they're talking about but if you are canadian if you're but if you get a sort of semblance of what's going on up there it's the same thing we have down here like mm-hmm. you know there was a there were these uh, Mark McKinney and Bruce McCullough play these two cops. Yes. Oh, and it's man. just, it's some of the funniest stuff. Like, like they're interviewing uh, Scott Thompson. Did you, kill, did you kill that guy? No. No, we got to think of something else. Uh, you want a TV? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. And they're all sitting there watching this. They're laughing. Did you kill that guy? No. No, I didn't. <laughs> what a disturbing thing for an office. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I mean, it was just, it was just fun to watch, but there were characters in it. If you've ever seen the show, I don't know if you guys have seen the whole, all the episodes yet. Um, I've seen a bunch growing up and re saw a bunch of them recently. It's like, there's man. two characters they did that Mark McKinney and, uh, Mark, no, it wasn't Mark McKinney. It was, uh, it was, um, David Foley and, Kevin McDonald did called the Sizzler Sisters, right? Yes. There are two escaped mental patients with wigs on, dressed in robes, and they go, oh, Jenny, Jenny, and it's like it's like they're hyperactive, and they call everybody prick, but they yeah. they'll say like you prick like that. Yes. And, oh my god. <laughs> it's, it's like, oh Jenny, we must train for the seventy six Olympics. You know, they, like they go to they, they invade a nightclub. They're like. We don't need it. This is just, just like thing. What's that he has on stage? Did you get the piano player we asked for? Yes, yes, I did. What's that? It's a piano, and he's a piano. Get it off the stage. We're an acapella act. Strangers in the night. Oh yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, We're stylists. You know. <laughs> it was just so. It was so weird to watch it, but they're like hyper. It's like they're these hyperactive mental patients but you're trying hard you're, you're laughing hysterically at it right it's like you know uh one flew over the cuckoo's nest if it yeah. was even more just batshit just 
the just dimensional level is like and we're laughing with it and it like um, you say they they they, they, the- they clearly have just that they, they're they're talking about stuff is like that only if even a philosopher finds disturbing and I, I definitely see a lot of it in Mr. Show and just all these other just groups that we all love and talk about. Is like there's well, just, it's just I was are kind of crazy. I, I always look at Mr. Show as like the spawn of Kids in the Hall. It's definitely the cousin. It's definitely got to be. It's it's the it's the cousin or the offshoot because you got to realize Kids in the Hall were t- you know were SNL at that time. And I always say the parallel is funny because you got to think 89, 90, 91, 92, SNL's hitting a high point. You know, they've got Wayne's World and all this stuff. And then everybody starts leaving slowly, you know, whereas Kids in the Hall from like 92 to 95, nobody's leaving the show. You know, they're doing little guest spots and whatnot, but there's nothing really, you know. And then, you know, and the thing is, is that that whole six years it was on, nobody left. The, nobody left the show. They didn't have any be- thing better to go. This was their bread and butter. They were loyal you know, to us. Right. I mean, look, look, come, come on. How can you not remember this one when they're using the most unusual methods to convince a bunch of World War II paratroopers to finally jump off the plane? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think I find in many ways that is the segue for how the whole show was done. Is like we got. 45 minutes each episode you i mean and, and every show owes a lot to it like uh they're all lampooning a lot of the stuff that they grew up watching doing their take on it but the reason these guys survive is again they love what they do and like you say they they all have an equal voice they're not overlapping yeah. one another it's not just two running the show and it isn't a rock band that's destined for failure because they, they just can't stand one like another. like rod torkelson's armada featuring herman mender <laughs> oh damn that's a ways back damn <laughs> yeah to go there and but yeah well, that's, not gonna... that's one of the characters it's these, it's these three guys it's called Rod Torkelson's Armada featuring Herman Mendelchuk, and they're like this garage band that goes nowhere. You're right. But, you know, if you were a teenager and you were in a band, you could totally relate to that, you know. Uh, a thousand percent. Uh, kind of reminds one of Spinal Tap. Now. Yeah. <laughs> it's but, making fun of the whole, no, nobody gets anybody. <laughs> yeah. It's like, they're just like, they're like, there's one part they're just doing, like, they're doing this song and they're like, Check, 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 check. All right, let's do trampoline girl. One, two, three. They start playing like 30 seconds into it, like, wait, check, 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 check. Wait, Mike, Mike, put the mic up, put the mic, check, check, but check, pop, 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 check, check. You know, that's that's and I was in a couple of garage bands, and that's what it's like, you know. You keep thinking you're gonna hit it big, and like, you know, that's what it's like. You know, you you're all trying to figure out where you stand. I mean, and for me, when they do teenagers, it was that awkwardness too. It was a yeah. great uh, get together because yeah, they that uh, you you legit feel like uh, they they not only sync, they're just also just good actors. You believe every yeah, role right. that they're saying, and then the twist is we're gonna somehow make this funny because no yeah. one else can make it funny. Everyone else well, overthink it or let their morals. It's just like it's all play and pretend. It's our oysters. Yeah. Let's, let's let's make use yeah. of it. <laughs> well, the the thing you gotta realize, and, and this is, and I said before, five seasons, nobody leaves. Python was on for four seasons, and Cleese left on that fourth season. You gotta realize the dynamic shifted. The show, yeah. the tone of the show changed, and for this, five of them going through five seasons, and you know, or you know, six if you count, you know, five seasons, you know you know, from 89 to 95, you know, it was all an equal voice. There wasn't, I mean, there, there were never any sketches, I think, where I saw like, you know, that's, you know, the, you know, oh, I know who wrote that. You didn't know who wrote the sketches half the time. You, you really was You know, and, Python. And if, if they were to debate who wrote what, I'm sure they'd give each other credit. They don't have a problem with one another and they're not too proud yeah. and they never acted like, again, like you say, this is one guy running the show and Monty Python, unfortunately, like many comedy groups, you know, when someone yanks 
the world from under your feet, you know, then you do have that year where it's like not everyone's talking about you, you're working, but you're doing all this other stuff that's awesome and or a misfire because someone messed with it and yeah, and no one saw it. And could, at the same time, they're just like, can you go back to doing what we knew you for? And it's just like, it, it's rough being a comedian because you do have to prepare yourself for the harsh reality. Yeah. Yeah, we well, call the McLean Stevens, Stevenson effect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We call it the McLean Stevenson, Larry Linville, um, Suzanne Summers. Uh, let's see. <laughs> oh, um, Henry Winkler. <laughs> And no, no, let's see. Uh, uh, Donnie Most. Um, no, I can't say anything about Tony Donnie Loves Most. Chachi. Johnny Loves Chachi. Um, is... you know, uh, Marla Gibbs gets her own TV show. Um, not 227, the other one. Uh, checking out with Larry Linville, which is kind of weird. But yeah, you got kids in the hall. HBO took them off, they get picked up by CBS. There's a whole new audience there, and you got to realize 90, 92, 93, you know, they're starting to get, you know, it's like this, this thing, college kids watch it, high school kids watch it, you know, if you watch, you know, there's, there's so many great sketches in that show, none of them really fall flat, you know? No. None of them really, like, they don't go, it's like they don't go nowhere, you know? And the great thing was that Python, you know, was like the first, I think the first comedy team that did like outdoor film, they would do film, they would do a film, uh, like these out, like these film vignettes, you know, Very where nice. it was, uh, you know, and they would, you know, they'd incorporate them into the show. Like they did one just, I saw now called God is dead. <laughs> and they're like, two <laughs> philosophers say that God is dead. But there are two skeptics. And says, God is yes, God is dead. And this guy's holding like a little like person in his arms, like cover up. He's like, God, I never realized God was that small. And it's like the guy's like holding his his hand up like two feet off the ground. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> and you're also seeing. I mean, they're using the most un uncanny ways to like introduce all these segments. They're they're using yeah fake. Uh, uh, just a bizarre news segment and then <laughs> just going from there is just like uh, and yeah, the little black and white bits in between you know the little black and white film they would have in between you know yes. just showing them like goofing off like doing something silly or something like that you know that was that was kind of like what terry gilliam gilliam would do they didn't have a terry gilliam right. but they would have these little these little parts in between and the music too kind of helped out because where Monty Python had the Liberty Bell March, yes. um, they had they had shadowy men from a shadowy planet doing having an average weekend, you know. <laughs> but oh, that's um, it's great. But but like, I gotta say this: like the the last three seasons of that show that were on CBS were just joyful to watch, you know. No difference, and at a later time where they could still get away with some stuff. Yeah, um, they they Adult would swim does some... not exist without this. No, no, Adult swim, swim would not exist. I don't think Tom and Eric, uh, Eric uh, Tim and Eric, Tim and Eric, exist. yeah, they wouldn't exist. <laughs> um, you know, Mr. Show wouldn't exist. The whitest kids you know wouldn't exist. Oh, that's a um, good. That is a good interlude. You know, oh my god, yeah. And upright the, citizen upright citizen. Brigade, brigade, yeah. You know. Upright citizen. Oh my god, you mentioned this. But they were kind of concurrent with what was going on. Um mm -hmm. you know, and you gotta think too, David Foley was on like one of the first episodes of Mr. Show. So that was oh, kind of that's like, right. Yes. <laughs> so that was kind of like a baton passing, like here, you guys take it now, we did it. And the thing is, the the last couple of episodes, you it, they didn't they they made like a they didn't make an over like you know hey you know thanks for those seasons all this stuff. it was just you know it was just so it kind of like it it knew when to stop. Correct. You know? It wasn't, and, and like you say, it helped that every segment you never knew how long it was going to go, and that worked, yeah. that got that made it helped it get even more unpredictable and. Yeah. Well, 
that that is a good contrast as white as kids you know did try doing a few movies that weren't big hits but are definitely part of the underground comedy scene i do see people show a meme and i know instantly what they're referencing but you gotta think too also python they this is the connection with python too python on their third season did a thing called the cycling tour which was an episodic um which yes. was just one long sketch for a half an hour yeah the the you got to be kids in the hall the kids in the hall do one called chalet 2000 where it's these characters like queen elizabeth has to go to canada because of and buddy has a like a uh, buddy cole has like a chalet that he, he stays at and he, bruce mccullough is like a beaver david foley and and uh kevin uh kevin are dressed up as like the the fur trappers who, are, who like hunt people down for their suits yes <laughs> you know and then there's then there's a part where like this big block of ice gets rolled in and you don't know who it is till the end and you realize it's rip taylor yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. you know, and uh you know but it was it was it was it was this this dynamic they had you know where it was the five of them and then brain candy came along <laughs> yes and even strangers I say, with candy for that matter that, yeah that amy sadara show i feel owes a lot to that just don't do comedy that everyone else expects <laughs> yeah they were they were breaking the they were breaking all these things like you know I mean I just remember the last episode they did these three sketches that were banned by by the seat by the seat by the network right it's, <laughs> yes. it, was, it was a sketch and that the works first in their one, favor never seen Hitler, on TV <laughs> Hitler blanks a donkey like we have to speak like Gene Rayburn right so it cuts <laughs> to it cuts to, it cuts to um, <laughs> It comes oh, to Kevin shit. McDonald and Dave Foley, and Kevin McDonald's like a little kid. He goes, "Daddy, Daddy, what's that man doing?" And and uh, <laughs> Mark, Dave Foley goes, "That's no man, son. That's Adolf Hitler, and he's fucking your donkey." It cuts over to uh, <laughs> it cuts over to Bruce McCullough <laughs> with a donkey tail waving in his face, just like Hitler, you know, banging a donkey, going, "My Eshman, Elder, that isn't you know, like that." <laughs> and then he cuts back and says, "Next one we have is the home run." Oh, so it's. it's 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 um Bruce McCullough as as like like this sickly kid, right? Yes. And Dave, and Dave Foley's like a baseball player. And he's like, "You gonna hit a home run for me, Joe?" He's like, "Yeah, kid, I'll hit a home run for you." And he's and he's listening to the ball game, and he goes, he goes, he goes, you know, oh, there he goes, Joe hits, Joe strikes out. God, you know, they use six to two of the Tigers. Just the goddamn cancer kid. He made me blow the game. Too much pressure, and it cuts to like Bruce McCullough like, crying. He says. So then it cuts back to Dave Foley. Dave Foley's like, I know you couldn't hit a home run for me, Joe. No, no, but I got you something different. I got you a $20 whore. <laughs> and this shows up and you see Bruce McCullough and that like that like like that sickly kid was go, okay, let me at that whore. <laughs> and then it cuts back. And he says, we have a, this is the last sketch of our show. In fact, it was so bad, even the other kids in the call didn't want to, didn't want to air it. It's called Soup Du Jour. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's Dave Foley sitting at a table and, 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 uh, um, which we call it is eating soup, right? Yeah. And he's like, this is good soup. What is it? You, you want to know what I made it out of? Yeah. Yeah. What'd you make out of? Have a couple more. Have a couple more. Have a couple more spoonfuls. This is really good soup. What do you mean? That? He's like. He's like. Okay. You want to know what I made it out of? What? I made it out of my own. And the screen cuts like to like like fizzle. <laughs> so he was gonna say I made it out of my own. You know. Um, but oh I mean, God. his own blank. Yeah, his oh, own blank. You thought, the, you thought the sensors were bad? Then I mean, they're still getting away with stuff on the current who's lying that anyone else would just balk at and it's ironic there's some stuff on there that they would have never allowed to air back then but then there's even other ones in the 90s that they were just barely getting through and there's what there is one great segment where they got interrupted uh, it's a historic pivotal moment of who's line fame where they got interrupted by one of their producers because they wanted to do a segment that oh man so on the money but it was years before they were allowed to do this they were like let's do a segment where it's 
Hitler and Bill Cosby singing. <laughs> oh, <Okay. laughs> yes. <laughs> and they did that they had to change it they're like oh what? What? Oh, okay i guess you guys are being hitler's to us we can't air this okay well i guess we'll change it to someone someone else in will cosby it's funny but, anyway. <laughs> you, you gotta think too well what else was big at that time too it was uh, kids in the hall. simpson oh no, you no. mean in terms of them to make fun of oh well <laughs> yeah. no 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 i'm saying i'm saying comedy groups the only yeah. thing that came close <laughs> to them at that time was the state. Ooh, yeah. yes. The state. So kind of like the state ran for, I think, two seasons, and that was it. And you got to think, too, the state went to CBS. They had their own TV show. Like they had that one CBS special, and that was it. Correct. Because nobody got the, nobody got the humor of the state. Yeah. I watched that, you know. When it was on MTV, it was unbelievable. It was great. When they got to CBS, they said, you know, they, they kind of tied them down. You know, yeah, <laughs> you're going too far, man. <laughs> but uh, you know, Stella was Michael Ian Black's kind of attempt to kind of recreate a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. Stella, Viva Variety. Now they got you know nine one one back on the air. Oh um, yes, and Reno nine one one is great because basically much you know much like what the police academy movies were doing is like it, it's it's going in places where it's like again it's just the characters are all doing just outrageous stuff and much like barney yeah. miller they're cops but it has nothing to do with anything else other than that it's just a random setting for all this outlandishness to happen uh, yeah psych has different degrees of comedy when you really want to look at it that isn't just yeah. making fun of other procedurals there and I mean, like you say, it seems like if you want to have something outrageous, you got to basically sell it to a network and then not promise them at all, all what yeah. you said you were going to show and just go ape shit. Just have the most outrageousness, just well, shit happening. But Kids in the Hall kind of opened up people's eyes to a lot of things, too. You know, like they had um, a series of sketches called Steps. <laughs> and steps steps was three gay guys yes. just you know just yeah just sitting outside having coffee you know one was like a big lunk head the other one was kind of a feminine and then um kevin mcdonald's i think scott thompson played like the the, the big lunk head <laughs> yes. um david foley played like the effeminate uh twink guy <laughs> and then and then um, um, Kevin McDonough played like the like the bespeckled, inter you know, intellectual gay guy, <laughs> and it was it was these sketches that didn't really like they were good because of the fact that number one, even if you were not gay or gay, you you got you you know it was funny to watch, you know, but um, you know it was funny to watch because the, the, it was just you know anything about a relationship or something. You got it. You know, you got what was going on. You, you, know, you know exactly and, what to expect. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. The, the and state they is they streaming get... on... The, the state is streaming on Paramount Plus, by the way, for those who want to know. Yeah, but they kind of cut, cut a lot of the stuff. Like, they don't have all the seasons, I think. I don't know really? if they have both the seasons, just one season. Yeah. It, it's You got to get the, bo the box set. Supposedly there's the box set with all the music in it and everything like that. Ah. Uh, Bastard, you know, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I, there, there were, there were, you know, there were those sketches that you know Scott wrote that were really good, and then you had like, you know, it was just, and then that last season, you know, every they go out on a high note, they don't go out on a low note where Python was just like, you know, it was a fart in the wind. Yeah. But then we start hearing rumors that they're going to make a movie. <laughs> You know, and we we're, everybody started thinking, okay, what are they going to do? And they come up with this movie called Brain Candy, which to me was a great idea on paper, but it fell flat at the box office. Yep. And if anybody's ever seen it, if you watch it and you get the jokes, yeah, ha, it's great. If you don't get the jokes, you're lost. <sighs> I think, in and, all fairness, I can't blame them for just winging it and just saying, hey, you know, uh, life is too short for us to just expect 
to catch you up with this. You know? Well, you got to think what came out that year. You had Mystery Science for the movie, Another Brain great Candy, movie that and Barbed people. Wire. Yeah. And Barbed Wire, yeah. Yeah. And like, you got to think too, uh, what was it? Mystery Science Theater went off the air in, officially in 96, I think. There was that. Yeah. And Comedy Central was trying out so many other things too. So. Yeah. And, you know, Kids in the Hall went off. So it was like these two little Kids in the Hall and Mystery Science Theater like, like, were these two little outlets, especially Kids in the Hall, because it was like this, this, this way of like, I could get, I got the humor, you know. But it Brain Candy, when realized. it came out, you know, Brain Candy came out. You couldn't find it anywhere. I couldn't even find it in any video store. It's rarely made any kind of... It might have aired on IFC at the most. It definitely hasn't yeah. been maybe on Showtime yeah. since it first came out. But I remember trying to look for it in the movie theaters and like, you know, one week later it was gone. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Somewhat but meanwhile you have Adam... It. Stan- was it Grammar City um, or... Gramercy, yeah, Gramercy did it. Sam, see, so they just fucked over two great comedy groups that year. <laughs> you know. And what I don't understand is like what you read about now is that Dave Foley had no input in that movie. Really? It was the it was he was he had left the group. And when he left he, you know, he was like, like, he was contractually obligated to do the movie. That's why you don't see him that much in the movie. It's basically Mark McKinney, Bruce McCullough, Scott it's Thompson, his, yeah. and Kevin McDonald. It's his compromise. Yeah. So it's just like, it's, okay. he makes these little jumps in and jumps out. And you can tell during the production when they show the behind the scenes production, he really just doesn't want to be there, you know. <laughs> and. That was basically his only compromise. Is like, okay, then I'll be yeah. in this of the movie. I'll still do it, but I'm not. Yeah, I'm gonna half-ass it because wouldn't you if they're censoring you and telling you what to do? You know, but that has some great parts. I mean, I love Scott, um, Mark McKinney's take on the boss. He's like Lauren Michaels. <laughs> yes. do, you, do you mind? We're having a brisk here. Oh man, that's he, that's before. That's before Michael Mike Myers, you know, was doing Doctor Evil. That voice was, you know, that's Lauren Michaels right there, you know. Oh yes. Um, we'll return after these messages. Do you ever find yourself thinking about who would win in a fight between Goku and Superman? Hi, I'm James Gavsey, and on the Who Would Win show, me and my co-host Ray ignore anything important happening in the outside world and debate fictional battles between characters from comics, movies, and video games. We got a new show every week, and almost always, am I the winner? (laughs) Yeah, not true, Ray. In the past, we've discussed such matches as Captain America vs. Darth Vader, Solid Snake vs. the Iron Giant, classic matchups like Robocop vs. Terminator, and even the Muppets vs. Sesame Street. That one was crazy. So if you're a fan of geek culture and love a spirited debate, check out the Who Would Win show wherever you get your podcasts, or check us out at whowouldwinshow.com. We let things pile up in the DVR. We add them to our queues. We wait for the DVDs and Blu-rays. We time shift. The Time Shifters podcast. Sci-fi, horror, fantasy, superheroes, comedy, action, film, television, maybe some not-so-current events. Find us on iTunes or at timeshifterspodcast.com. Cool thing about Blind Knowledge is we are in multiple countries. We are worldwide all across the globe. We are in the U.S. We are in the U.K. We are in Canada, Germany, India, Japan. We're in Australia, y'all. Blindknowledge.com. Now back to the feature presentation. 
Dragon Ball Z, One Piece, Naruto, all things that we love, all manga that were originally published in the legendary magazine Weekly Shonen Jump. But not every series can run for 300 chapters and have a hit anime. This is David. This is Jordan. We're the hosts of Shonen Flop. Each episode, we look at manga that ran and jumped that didn't quite make it. We discuss what it did wrong, what it did right, how the series could have turned itself around, and ultimately, was it a flop or not? Run all your favorite podcast apps, and you can find us at shonenflop.com. Keep on flopping, floppers. And the way they do it is that, you know, it's the story was just great. This scientist invents a drug that cures depression, but you become comatose after you take it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes. You know, and it was just, you know, it was just a smart idea. And then they then they broke up after that. But there were all these little things that were, you know, you would see them pop up. And, like, of course, you know, Dave Foley was doing news radio for, what, three seasons? Right. And at that point, yeah. you know, even though your heart's in it, it's also career security, you know, so it's just like, yeah. you can coast on that and then do a bunch of other funny movie cameos. He's yeah. the best part about the dud that is Postal. <laughs> um, Bruce McCullough did Shame Based Man, which was a great record. Mark, <laughs> And then him and, him and Mark McKinney got hired that 96 season or 95 season, I don't remember what season it was, they got hired to go on SNL. And Mark McKinney was like, he did Chicken Lady for one episode. And that, <laughs> but that, that was just like, you know, what the hell, you know, like, you know, he didn't get the, it, no, it was like, it was like, he did, he did this, he did the sketch, but then he would do something with uh, David, uh, what's his name? Where they played two fops. David Spade? No, no, not David Spade. David, no, no. David, cr- 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 David Coulter. Yes. Okay. There we go. David Kohler. Um, the guy from uh, Anchorman. The guy who had like the, the cowboy hat on. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And they played two fops who would be on Weekend Update. And he survived that big um, cast turnover that brought in like Will Ferrell and, you know, all those. Adam McKay. You know, that, that, yeah. Yeah. All those guys. And he left, and now then he was doing like movies and stuff like that. Kevin McDonald was work, you know, was doing work. Um, I think they got a big paycheck from Warren Michaels, to be honest with you. Um, oh, he and then, loved him. He just didn't know how to market him like he did just yeah. with anybody. And he wound up doing Lilo and Stitch. That's right. For a couple seasons, he was in the movie. He played Professor Pico. Yep. With um, with, Simple, with think this rule, yeah, and then he goes to, does the TV show. Now this was the kicker. They had oops, Professor Peakley, excuse me. Professor Peakley is getting married, and they decide. The guys at Disney decide. Look, wouldn't it be funny if Peakley's family was played by the kid, the other guys, and the kids in the hall. <laughs> oh, and they got them together. All right. This is like 2002, 2003. I remember seeing the episode too because I was home and I'm like, oh my God, this is so cool. Nothing dirty, nothing nasty. It was just, you know, it was just them doing, you know, Peakley's getting married and, you know, it's like Bruce McCullough, you know, Scott Thompson plays his mother, you know, Bruce McCullough plays his father, you know, Mark McKinney plays the priest. I think David Foley played like his brother or something like that. Um, and it was fun. And then you started to hear rumblings. Are they going to get back together? Maybe, you know, maybe not. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. Um, and they got together in 2007. <laughs> and I think by that time, you know, they, were, they went on tour. And then they did, and then a couple of years later, they did a show called Death Comes to Town. Yes. Which should have been brain candy, I think. Totally. This is it. It's like studios know how to just always just get in the way by picking the weaker material instead of the yeah. stuff that really kills. The stuff but that's just, weaker, but haha, as opposed to belly aching funny, that should be the in between. <laughs> yeah. Bra- Death Comes to Town should have been what brain candy was. I mean, you know, I'm saying, I mean, the other way around. Like, you know, brain candy was good. Death Comes to Town was better, 
And not only that, Scott Thompson is fighting leukemia. If you watch those yeah. episodes, he's bald. I thought he had a bald cap on. No, he was fighting leukemia at that time. And he beat it. Thank God. Um, because if you watch, he has like he doesn't have any hair on his head. And Scott Thompson was on, was on that show Providence. Oh, that's right. Show. Shit. Yeah. He was on that show. He played the ba- the not a bad gig. Sister. Just stare at Marina no. all day. It's a- no, he, he he basically was this. He was the baker, the younger sister's helper with the bakery for the dog treats. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you get to stare at Marina all day. It's, it's a yeah, yeah, <laughs> but. Um, but you know it was, it was fun it was it was good you know it's good to see them back together again it's good to see that the material's edgier now you know right and, some people were taken aback it's like okay you guys clearly were not paying attention you know it was just you know some of the stuff it was like you know like this the part where um what is it mark and and scott played two cops I know two robbers, and they're yes. busted by the co- busted by the cops, but they come out naked from the car. They got a street because they're looking for two yeah. robbers, not two naked men. <laughs> and you see their generals, and you're like, I remember just watching that, going, "Holy shit, Dave Manscapes!" <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you know. But to see some of the characters come back was was great. Like Buddy Cole finds the last glory hole in Canada. Oh yeah, and. Yet, and he has to get his he he gets he gets the last wish. You have to make a wish, buddy. You have to make a wish. You know, first <laughs> off, Queen Elizabeth declares it a national monument. <laughs> and then he's like, I can make one wish. Okay. He sticks his he sticks his dick in the hole and he gets the bar back. <laughs> you know. Um but it they had they had some, they had some great they had some great returns for characters and you know. Especially, like you say, the the two female co-workers, they, they did good to bring in that yeah. back. Um, the two cops coming back. Um, oh, yes. But, was, but I, I love the one where the guy, where Mr. Tizadatic was going to crush the, the uh, CNE tower. <laughs> and, like, they have, they have uh, Drunk Dad. No, yes. was his, what was it? Bruce McCullough plays the, the drunk father who's a superhero. <laughs> he, comes, he comes in and like he's he's got uh was it dave dave foley plays his uh his bartender sidekick yeah this is like the most the unlikely enabler. duo the enabler yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah that's drunk enough to go fight crime yeah he's like come on pal let's be friendly bang you know um but yeah i mean th- those sketches were great and now they're you know they left on a cliffhanger for season two yeah, we've been waiting all these years. <laughs> Please give us a season two. That's all we ask. You know, don't don't leave us in the lurch. No more. You know? I, I think you know. they're, they're going to get good numbers, and it helped that Amazon had also bought some of their live, more recent stand-ups, reunion tours. So they're, they're set for life. They're definitely going to do at least three more. Yeah, years. yeah. But you look at their impact nowadays, you know, Younger comics or younger theater troops are going to look at their stuff and be like, oh, that's what you need to like younger comedic theater troops are like, yeah, that's what we should be doing that shit, you know, you know, it's like, it's like you watch, you got to think SNL. And I, I, I always say, I hate to say this, but SNL was good, but Kids in the Hall was way better. That's yeah, fine. Because I, yeah. SNL had to stick to a formula and a time constraints and commercial breaks, and they yeah. basically were like, just don't do anything too crazy that we got to censor, even though there's but, plenty of stuff that'll but, go best there. But you guys think some of those people that left that show, you know, it went, they, their careers went into overkill, you know? Yeah. Like, how much, you know, and I, I'm not putting, um, you know, he's a, he's a funny guy, but like, Adam Sandler, David Spade, Chris Farley, you know, how many times did you see a movie from them, you know, to, you know. They oversaturated their market before they even had one. Yeah, yeah you know, exactly. it's like, you know, and it was like, you know, Mark McKinney, you know, Dave Foley, you know, you would see them pop up and you'd be like, oh, oh, oh thank God, a breath of fresh air, you know. Thank but, um, goodness, that 
these guys, they get it. They know what they are and they, they all get along and they'll do this till the sun sets. And the yeah, thing I'll, is, I'll take a step further. I'll go ahead. Okay, I'll take a step further. I'll, I, it's not just that they know who they are. It's they also know who they were. They that, never stopped like being talk, it, even when the cameras turned exactly. off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's like when, you, when you're playing teenagers, they're tapping into what a lot of comedians felt at that point in time. They were awkward. They didn't fit in with one group or another. So, so they were able to tap into that to create the characters that related to the audience. So we're, yeah. So we're, and you're talking you're able to you're translate to an, it. yeah exactly you're talking you're talking to your own in, in that kind of sketch and that's one thing i've, I've noticed especially with uh, dave foley is that he and I'm not to disparage any of the others but he's somebody who gets the character and finds a way to not only make it relatable but also to take it to that next weird level he was in an episode of, of the live action Tick. Yes, he played he played a psych uh, like a psychiatrist. I think was trying to convince people that they weren't superheroes. And in when in secret, he was he wanted to be a superhero himself. The scene where he puts on a cape and starts doing his version of the theme to the Greatest American Hero. When I saw that for the first time, I was just my sides hurt <laughs> because it was unexpected but yet so perfect in that in that situation he found something unusual but found a way to make it so that everybody everybody knew about it <laughs> or yeah, can relate to it or see it <laughs> right and Every- all five of them are just again they're used to wearing multiple hats and getting their moment in the sun but yeah I mean that they're they still had some acting pedigree and so they're doing more than just following the rules of improv and acting and whatever they want to do they also have experience with just I can say how about I say it this way now how about I say it another way it works either way but we'll ultimately choose how we want to say it and how we want to do it well the Sorry. thing is, there were characters that they channeled in. Like, I remember Mark McKinney doing a character called Daryl. <laughs> he was like this bespeckled intellectual. Like, his parents were like very, like, you know, he's, it's like, he's like just the total, like, intellectual, you know, oh, well, that's, that's a funny joke you have there, you know? <laughs> and it's like, it's like, I know people like that. Like, Everyone's Bruce McCullough. given that kind of line where you're like, whoa, 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 he's a smart ass, eh? <laughs> Bruce, Bruce, no, it's like, he's like, he's, he's like, he's like, he goes, he goes, ah, oh, shall we toast the old pigs come around today? You know, he's like, <laughs> he's like and the kid just looks at him, he's like, you're weird. He's like, no, no, no. He like, like, he's, he's playing, he's doing, he does a thing where he takes a kid for big, like, big brother. <laughs> he's, like, yes. he's like, let's do something fun today. He takes him to a, a museum where they're looking at this like painting. He's like, "You see the brush strokes there? Those were done." You know, and the kids is looking. I'm like, "What the hell?" You know, and he takes me. Says, "Oh, now these are rare, rare Etruscan coins. I have some of these." And the guy's like, "Man, this is Etruscan coin. No, this no. It's a, it's a coin. This is from 1755, the year the the you know invaded invaded Poland." It's like interesting history huh and you know it's just like oh my god you like he's just so detached from everything that character and then there's the opposite end where um you've got bruce mccullough doing this guy kid named bobby right yeah and uh he's like this like stoner rebel guy right so it's it's um mark mckinney playing the father i think Dave Foley's playing the mom, and they're eating yes. ham steak. Yeah. They're eating ham steak. He says, "What do you think of that, Bob? <laughs> what do you think of that ham steak? This is some fine fucking ham, mom." <laughs> and then, and they, what did you say? And he goes, "Fine ham abounds." Like you like covering. <laughs> like, what did you say to your? You know, 
Here, what did you say again? <laughs> yeah. It's just and then they have then they have these two characters. It's um Fran and Gordon, which are Scott Thompson as Fran and Bruce McCullough as Gordon. And they're like the atypical um middle-aged couple raising a teenage kid and there's this one part where they're lying in bed and she wakes up and bruce mccall is drinking water he says what's what's the matter dude everything okay with her no it's that goddamn salty ham you gave me i didn't expect that voodoo cork in this house you know this is something that happened with my parents one time my father argued with my mother about how the turkey should be cooked on thanksgiving next time you know (laughs) this is this was like reflecting into my private life you know and I was like, holy shit, that's my parents, you know. Um, but it was all these characters they did that would pop up. Like they had they had uh Scott Thompson and uh Scott and I think it was Dave as two hookers. Yes. Oh fuck. And that and one, man, oh man, do they get risque on that one? They they were like, you know, they're like, you know who called last night? Bobby. Yeah, it was his first time. It was his first time too, to, you know, first time from, from you know with him two nights ago. That little liar, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff that you can only imagine but, if they joked about it. If prostitutes joked about that in real life, <laughs> would it even they had, they, had a, they had they had they had two they had two characters on there. Fran- Francesca Fiore played by Scott Thompson and Bruno Ponce Jones played by um Dave Foley and they're like this international couple jet set <laughs> and she's got like this like she's got like this like short bang hair she wears like these fashionable outfits and she walks in the courtroom and like all these and then David Foley walks in as Bruno Ponce Jones and he's like got like a white hat you know white linen suit white tie you know like, like yeah, you know he looks like a like, yeah. yeah and it was just it's funny to watch you know where they're doing one sketch she's like you know he he you know I wonder where Bruno is. He late. And you hear a voice go, no, he is late. No, he late. No, he is late. Say it, say it again. He, 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 he late. late. <laughs> yeah, you see, no, he is late. Say this. He, he, is, is late. Oh, he is late. And Bruno Pancho <laughs> says, uh, Francesca, what's for dinner? He says, you are two, you two hours late. Bruno. No, you are two hours late. And he, he shoots the ceiling and the guy falls down from the ceiling. He's like, what shall we do? Well, we could eat him. <laughs> it was just like, <laughs> you know. Oh, man. I, just, I mean, I missed that show. So, I mean, it was it's great to look back on those shows. When you think of the time when you're growing up, when you're, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20 years old, and you're starting to, you know, it kind of like helped you grow up in the world a little bit too, you know? unfortunately yeah you do want to relive it and at the same time it's fortunate enough that you know it's been kept alive all these years and it's not going away anytime soon the fandom will always be no there. no i always i i think the one thing that gets me and i'm and it, you know it wasn't like and, and i gotta say this like again python they would do the greatest hits all the time they would always go out and see, this last season of Kids in the Hall, it was new sketches. Some characters came back, some came in, you know, some some were left out. You know, it was good to see them, even though they were older, it was good to see them. It was like, it was like, oh, okay. The band got back together, they got a new record, and it still <laughs> sounds great. You know, right. no phoniness, exactly. no cash in, no past their prime. Show. You know, it's like that they, they, they made their age even part of the joke. That's who else could do yeah. that? Everyone else is just like, oh, I, I can stand up for this amount of hours, but I'm I'm done after this skit. <laughs> well, the yeah. thing I love this the thing I love was seeing uh, uh, Bruce McCullough as Gavin, and the woman goes, "You're fifty something years old. How come you're still paying a twelve year old?" You know, it just cuts over to where they where the thing is supposed to be. Yeah, just all these age gaps, and it's like, where 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 the hell were you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you guys think? I mean, I think it's I think it's one of the it's one of the it's a cult comedy show. I've never also, encountered any pricks who were stuck up about it or like I don't get it. I I think it's just another rarity in 
of breaking so many molds and layers to comedy and just still finding your audience. See, where I grew up, it was SNLville. So you had kids doing Adam Sandler imitations and everything like that. And I would, you know, I'd be sitting there going, yeah, I'd be doing like, you know, I'd be doing like, you know, I crush your head. I crush your head. <laughs> there, was, there were some kids that got it, but in my time, it was, you know, it was, you know, it was, you know, where I grew up, it was like, you know, New York's 26 miles away from me. Canada's like 350 miles away from me. You know, how, you know, but it just, it, it's just the comp, the half hour, that half hour was just an escape, you know. And then you'd watch SNL, you'd be like, oh, oh, what sketch are they going to do now? Oh, Wayne's World, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm man. going to, uh, I take a, a, a longer view of it. I, I want to say that Gen X, and maybe even a little, a little of the late boomer stage, this was the golden age of television comedy or at least or comedy in general because you had your monty python then you get in the 70s you you're going to get your sitcom from there but you're also going to get great things from like george carlin and um, richard Pryor, and then in the eight and even snl in its early days was so breathtaking and revolutionary then yeah. the 80s things you get started getting HBO and stirring to do some get to see more comedians doing comedy specials and and going out and then even then you got the, the Eddie Murphy years of SNL which kind of also gave way to some of the, the talent that would really bleed in the 90s and you've got the kids in the hall you've got uh, the Ben Stiller show you've got the state you've got Thank you. yeah you've, you've got uh, ben Stiller was recently people. on Smartless and talked about how he had to just slowly so soak that all in. You know, you do a good job on the Ben Stiller show and then you get canceled and then you win the Emmy for best primetime comedy show. Exactly. It's like a lot of people are slowly evolving in this area. And it's like, I, I've even seen a lot of great actors recently in interviews say the best medicine is to not worry if you're doing a good job or not, just keep doing it. But whatever you're comfortable exactly. with, whatever you know you can do, just unleash it. Eventually, you will be rewarded. Someone will note and highlight uh, what you pulled off just so remarkably. Well, yeah, I, to me, it was like, and then when you talk, go ahead. Oh, yeah, go ahead. No, you, you talk, then, go uh, ahead. Yeah, then you've got in there, also in the 90s, you got Mr. Science Theater 3000, and then you've got Mad TV at, at the very end and into the, into the 2000s. And now comedy is kind of is where is it where it used to be, um, but in that but in that gap between Monty Python and Mad TV, you've got uh, just a cornucopia of different comedy styles, different comedy approaches, sketch comedy versus stand up comedy versus improv versus this versus that. You you. It was a buffet, and you would never go hungry. Yeah, Ooh, and that's the, <laughs> that's the way I see it. Because to me, you got to think SNL from 1980 to that 1980 season almost killed it, right? The Dean Demanian. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then they bring in Dick Ebersole, and he starts bringing in people like Christopher Guest, Billy Crystal. You know, Harry Shearer comes back. You know, Eddie, Mur and then then Lauren Michaels comes back. I think in eighty. 87 and you know he starts bringing in all these other you know this new talent you know and you know that SNL becomes the big you know powerhouse again but you know you got to think too you know that was like that's like mainstream rock and roll you know oh, yeah. because even though they had some great writers on that show you know, after a while, you know, you start to get listless of what you're watching. And then all of a sudden you see these guys in Canada come in and they're doing, they're, you know, in a half an hour, they're breaking, they're breaking, they're, they're running three fifths of a mile in 10 seconds. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. that's, <laughs> that's the way I view it. They're smashing the doors down, you know, and, and nothing, nobody had done that with since Python, you know, where Python was, you know, 
taking apart the whole British social system, you know, and Kids in the Hall was taking apart the Canadian social system. But not only that, they were doing it on such a level where if you were in if you were in the United States, you got it. You got what they were doing. You got the humor, you know, and you got to realize too. Down for the count. <laughs> you got to realize too. SNL had all those writers on it. These guys were five guys who were writing, and they did the material. There was no outside help, you know. They did it all themselves. And, no, no input. But the thing I I found sad is that Tom, you brought this up. The buffet was there. Either you yes. ate it from it, or you went to you went and you got your fast foods. You got your food somewhere else, because I remember those shows. You know kids in the hall then mystery science theater then the state is jumbled in there then mr show and then you know i was watching like beavis and butthead there was a show on hbo called full frontal tv which barely anyone remembers because they do one of the best sketches ever called raging bullwinkle (laughs) yeah you have to watch it mario cantone is in it they they have bullwinkle doing uh um raging bull and he goes, come on, you hit like a faggot. Come on, you know, like that, you know. Um, <laughs> oh, it's it's great to watch. And then they, and then there was another show. Does anybody remember Dana Gould doing JFK Break On Through? I think I've seen a variation oh. of that. He does so many impressions of people. <laughs> he did. He did a thing. I remember, but it was kind of in that 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 sketch of like, all right, let's take the principal in. You know, it's you know. J, you know, Oliver Stone has brought you JFK and the Doors, but let's do one J, JFK break on through, where he's like, we said, and like, and also cool trans, he comes over and he starts doing Jim Morrison like on stage and stuff, <laughs> and it's it's funny to watch, but it was all of a sudden there was this there was just like alternative, you know, and I always say it's not alternative, it's like the other the other way like you said it was a buffet you had the ben stiller show you had mad tv before they pulled that you had um what was that one fox had um in living color that had what you no not in living color it was another one oh you know, house had, uh bumping or whatever it had john leguizamo no 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 it was when they had like what chewbacca is doing right this minute Ooh. What Phil Sims is doing right this minute. It was it was some show. Two um, thousands or nineties? No, nineties. Yeah, I, I think uh, I I I have a vague rem- remembrance of one that had like Wayne Knight and Jennifer Aniston yes. and. Hang on, let me look. I want to see what it was. <laughs> now we're now we're all going like what show? Hey, we're in the zone. Um, we're we're looking up all these yeah. treasures. Let me see what I can find here. Yeah, but the the thing about Kid in the Hall that that really struck me is I first became aware of them fully when I was when they were showing reruns on Comedy Central because I would always see advertising for them during guess what. Mystery Science Theater 3000. Correct. And there was a sketch that I absolutely, or at least part of a sketch that uh, they asked, they asked someone who was in drag, is that, who are your favorite male role models? They mentioned B. Arthur, somebody else, and Rosalind Russell. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like even the Edge. That was what it called. It was called The Edge. The yes. Edge. And it was Julie Brown, Charlie Cal. No, wait, it was, um, let's see. Julie Brown, Jennifer Anderson, Tom Kenny, Wayne Knight. Yeah, Jill Talley. Who, so you've got Tom Kenny and Jill Talley who would go to Mr. Show. Julie Brown, who did um, Just Say Julie. Yeah, that was, a, <laughs> it was only on for like, God, it wasn't on that long. Hey, you can find episodes on YouTube. So you are set. But it also had uh, Rick Overton, Paul Fig, and um, Paul Fig. Paul, F- wait a minute, hang on. He was in Bridesmaids. Holy crow! Okay, 
<laughs> you just got directed Bridesmaids, okay. Um, and uh, Paul Allen Ruck was in it. Oh, yes. Yeah. So. Uh, That's badass. Yeah. It was. Uh, they would do a thing where the guest, the the entire cast, would get killed off in in various ways, like hit by a bus. <laughs> Another set falling on them. Others involved in explosions, decapitations, emoliation, hangings, employment by arrows, the troop being stuck to a vortex. You know, and they had <laughs> Bill Clinton doing the the bumpers, you know, between the sketches. So, but yeah, yeah, it was, that's, it's like, it's like, Kids in the Hall is going to last for a long time. Much like Python. Saturday Night Live, it's been on for always be uh, around. Yeah. It'll always be around, but how, for how much longer? Right. You know? Because there's gonna be a time when people they're gonna run out. I mean, now they're not this fun, they're not funny anymore. I don't yeah, think they're I as think fun they're as they used to be, you know. Uh, the ones who are funny, they don't even use properly. No, no. <laughs> I mean, I think that's the problem what they had with Mark McKinney when he came in. He had so many characters he could have brought in. But you know, yet again, there he was told, you know, no, you can do this character once, and that's it. And it kind of, you know, it kind of did the same thing with uh, Martin Short when he was on SNL. Yeah, the, he, he, really, all the, all the all the ones he did on S SCTV, really, the only one that he got to play on it with any regularity, and it was a rare one he did was Ed Grimley. Yeah, yeah, I never saw him do any other character. I mean, well. There's the one he did with where they were doing like the takeoff on uh, 60 Minutes, where he's smoking, <laughs> yes. and then, and then he did the one with Harry Shearer and Christopher Guest where they were, um, they were trying to do synchronized swimming, men's synchronized swimming. Yes. And Christopher Guest is playing the court. Who's that? Who's that in the mirror? That's you. Oh, that's you waving at him and him waving at you. You know, and he's got, and he's got the <laughs> swimmies and the life vest on. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. You know, the kids in the hall, it was five seasons. It broke ground. I think a lot of shows took from that idea. You know, half an hour, try to expand the bounds as fast as you can. You know, try to break the door down. You know, and, you know, these were five talented guys that have gone on to their own paths, but, you know, they came back together. And they had new material, you know. And if you watch the new season, there's a lot of surprise guest shots on it. Like they do these little film bits in between, like Keenan Thompson's in it. Yeah. Uh, Tracy you Ellis Ross from Blackish. It's like, man, yeah. everybody's um, here. Who was it? Uh, what's your face? Um, uh, Fred Armisen. Fred Armisen is in it. No, the one, the, Catherine O'Hara does a shot on it. I bet. <laughs> I yeah. Oh. Watch that one. Yeah. Well, that. I love the one Keenan Thompson was being interviewed, and the woman comes in. and She goes, "What the hell are you doing in my house?" So oh, shit, <laughs> he runs out. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I think a lot of those. I think a lot of people were watching, were watching that show, going, you know, hey, if they can do it, I can do it. You know. Right. Never say no. Yeah, you know, but. It's been a delight run, and I'm sure they'll keep it up. And even if they go off for like five more years, they'll do it again. That yeah. they're they're past being burned, and they're past having to take a breather from it. That they're that they love what they do, and like you say, they have changed their comedy legends, and now that they're going to just keep using their unpredictable nature and keep outsmarting the whole genre of it as a whole. <laughs> well, yes. Here's the thing, they somebody said in an interview. One of them said in an interview, "We didn't want to be the Beatles of comedy. We wanted to be the replacements." Good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, because that's what they were. They were these five guys that were just like kicking the door down and not giving a shit about what you know what you could do in sketch comedy. And I think they they got a lot of that from like you know Second City, which you know is in Toronto, but you know. Yeah, because the yeah. the be the best you had in the LA scene was the Groundlings, and yeah, improv is all about just 
and you so have felt instead of climbing up a ladder that's already there, you come up with your own ladder. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I wanted to get the sketch. I wanted to start a sketch comedy troupe when I was like, you know, twenty, twenty one, and you know. It's hard to start. <laughs> it's hard to start, but you know, you try to figure out what you want to do, and I'm like, uh, no. If I try to <laughs> write like these guys, I'm gonna be ripping them off. They didn't rip off anybody. I don't think they were. I think the the women in the drag, you know, them being in drag was was hilarious. Oh yeah. Because they they did that well. All the little characters they came up with, they did that well. You know, um, the film bits were great. You know, um, just. So bold, so bold of them. And they, you know, they, there's one thing I always love is like there's this, there's this. I think it was the, this beginning of the second or third season. Scott Thompson's outside. He's like, you smell that? That's the crisp. I mean, that's the Christmas of spring. You know, <laughs> you know when thing when you know things are starting to grow and everything. Like that. And that's also the time when I bury my victims in my backyard. <laughs> like, holy crap. and then there's one oh, sketch fuck. he's walking out and this kid rides rides a bicycle and yells up fag adam right so you, you see him he comes out he's dressed like you know little t- you know shirt and pants on that kid, like, fag comes out he's wearing like this really like you know like garish outfit he got, you know the kid goes one by fag then you see him he comes out in like a leather outfit like one of the village people yeah. She goes, he comes, he runs, he, he kicks right on the bicycle and goes, fag, right? So then also the kid starts, like, <laughs> the kid's riding by, he stops his bike, he's looking around, you see this bear come out of nowhere and maul the kid to death, and the bear <laughs> takes off the head, and it's it's Scott Thompson, he looks at the kid and he goes, fag. <laughs> <laughs> and see, that, that's not something you could show on like SCTV. You had to follow a formula, and there they are. And there it just it was like re- repetition, repetition, and then whoa, that's the punchline. Oh, now I gotta go back and see how that connected from point A to well, point B. They do one sketch where um, <laughs> Scott, they're doing this. It's a restaurant. They're talking about the dipping areas on a plate. <laughs> yes. Oh, you ever seen that? Episode? That's a great sketch. That's a great. So, Hi, I'm new here. I was just wondering, are we having a problem with the dipping? See, I believe that, you know, you should have four dipping areas. One I for think the, Seinfeld one... totally stole that gag. Yeah, they did. They double did. dipping. I know they did. <laughs> um, no, no, that's not double dipping. It's because of, when you went to a restaurant back in the 90s, they would have these, like, exquisite, like, like, um, top of the line. Top of the line desserts. VIP. But you had yeah. these little chocolate dipping areas. You know, you take like, like you know, dark chocolate and light chocolate, and you would have to dip like a piece of the, you know, into each one, and you know, it's just this thing where they're like saying, "Well, can't you put the dipping area over here so your thumb doesn't touch the plate?" You know, it's like, <laughs> and it's just it's the four of them having this inane conversation about uh, dipping areas, right? And it, it's just it's just like your head's going, it's just like you start laughing, you're like you're like, oh my god, this is what it's this is you know, this is the silliest thing I've ever seen in my life, you know. People and, arguing about the most random stuff that won't yeah. change anything, but it's they not even arguing. It's, <laughs> it's just you know, well, I put one dipping area here, one dipping area, and it's like, oh, what do I put? Yeah, well, what about? Wouldn't you take some of the chocolate dusting off and put the dipping? No, no, no. Well, once you have two more dipping areas, well, I have nowhere to put the thumb on my plate. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. You know, but um, they used to do. They did one sketch where. Uh, this is dark. This is a very dark sketch. Everything um, is. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dave Foley is buying like Glade air freshener, you know, Glade plug in, you know, all this stuff. He's just, just, have a good right. day, sir. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not really. You see, I was a test tube baby. And he <laughs> starts, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, my life is shit because I, I have no, like, I can't look up to Louise Reed because she's the first test tube baby, but I was a test tube baby too. And then it cuts to him in an apartment. And he's talking to this corpse, and it's his father. He says, yeah, remember when you used to make fun of me for being a test tube baby? You used to tell me to put my head in the glass and say, hey, doesn't this remind you of childhood? You know, it's just so, <laughs> and he's like spraying the corpse with like, you know, so it doesn't smell, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, groundbreaking. Just stuff that 
you can't even repeat because where would you start? It just no one else is thinking on their level. <laughs> well, you know, I always say this. If you're having a shitty day and you're in an office somewhere and people are pissing you off, squint one eye down, take two fingers, and just start crushing heads. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then watch and then that office get... segment <laughs> of kids. Yeah. yeah. I'm crushing your head. I'm crushing your head. <laughs> I love, there's one there where the, the kid goes, oh, what's the matter? Says, oh, we lost our dog. And he's like, oh, that's terrible. They're like, yeah, yeah. What could, what can we cheer you up? Dun, 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 Doe, a deer, a female deer. <laughs> <laughs> they do the whole song from The Sound of Music and like, oh, there's your, you know, there's your thing, but there's your dog. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> what they do, what they do and where Scott Thompson and Mark, um, there's one sketches. Okay, try it now. They're trying to start the car up. And they're trying to see what the problem is. And he says, wait a minute, I found the problem. And there's like this little kid wedged in their car. He's like, oh, it's the Johnson boy. Send them home, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, they don't solve problems. There's, they one make Bruce, it worse. there's one Bruce McCullough did called My Pen. This guy has a pen, right? And he goes, Can I borrow your pen? Yeah. And he takes off and says, My pen, my pen. He's like, He's <laughs> yeah. around the city. And he's all these thoughts like the guy's putting the pen in his ear, you know, yeah. stabbing a guy to death with the pen. He's putting the pen in his mouth. He's like, My pen, my pen, my pen. <laughs> just look this stuff online you'll understand you know you get the gist of the whole thing you know yeah they they, they definitely invented youtube before youtube was a thing <laughs> oh man so thank you all uh we we have hopefully we have done a banged up job just summing up the highlights and immortal appeal uh so jj and tom uh what are you posting about next? <laughs> um, I'm going to be talking about Billy Jack. Woo! Oh, American I just got, Rambo, yes. I just got the four DVD set. Um, oh. I'm going to watch... I'm going to try to watch... Born, I'm going to try and watch Born Losers tomorrow night, which is the first one that they did. Um, yes. And then it goes Billy Jack, The Trial of Billy Jack, and then the famous... 1977 it got pulled because it wasn't doing enough business billy jack goes to washington to washington <laughs> um, one of the worst movies ever made everyone they said it. oh it's it's terrible i know it's but terrible <laughs> follow us on the web on facebook twitter and instagram the podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jack-tool.